Welcome to Master Concepts in Chemistry. In this lesson, we will discuss how sodium chloride dissolves in water. To start, let's look at the properties of sodium chloride in water. So sodium chloride is an ionic compound. So what this means is in sodium chloride crystal, you do have sodium plus and then chloride minus held together by an attractive force, which we call the ionic bond. So we can emphasize these charges by writing sodium plus and chloride minus. As a result of this plus and minus charges, we normally say sodium chloride is polar. So it has a positive end and a negative end. Now let's look at water. Water is a covalent compound. Meaning, water is formed when hydrogen and oxygen share electrons. Also, water is polar. So why is water polar? The reason is that hydrogen and oxygen share electrons to form a covalent bond. But the sharing of electrons is unequal because oxygen is highly electronegative than hydrogen. So in the shared bond, oxygen draws the shared electrons much more to itself than hydrogen. So as a result, in water, we do have a positive end and a negative end, making water polar. So we can emphasize this polarity in water by drawing a structure like so. So oxygen is partially negative charge and the hydrogens are partially positive. Now, we usually draw water with a bent shape because water has lone pairs and this lone pair sits on the oxygen and it affects the shape of water. So as you can see, we have similarity between sodium chloride and water. So they are both polar, which means that since they are both polar, they have similar intermolecular forces. So if you put sodium chloride in water, what happens is the oxygen end of water will attract the positive end of sodium chloride. So meaning oxygen will attract sodium and then chlorine and hydrogens will attract. So hydrogen will attract the chloride ion. So eventually, if you have your crystal in water, the oxygen will keep attacking and pulling away your sodium ions, and the hydrogen will keep attacking and pulling away your chloride ions. So eventually, your sodium chloride dissolves in water. So now, let's discuss the interactions that must occur for our sodium chloride to dissolve in water. So here we have a model. So we have a solute and a solvent. So sodium chloride is our solute and our solvent is our water. Usually the solute is always in smaller amounts and the solvent is in larger amounts. Okay, and the solvent dissolves the solute. Okay. So we want to classify these interactions into three. So the first one I'll call one and the second one I'll call two and then the third one I'll call three. So let's start with one. So first of all, as we know, our sodium chloride is held in a sodium chloride crystal. So what this means is the sodium chloride ions are attracted to each other and there's a bond, any bond that holds these ions together in the sodium chloride crystal. So for sodium chloride to dissolve in water, these ions must be free to move. So first, energy must be put in to break the attractive forces between our sodium and chloride ions. So one of these balls is our sodium and the other one is our chloride ion. So energy must be put in to break these attractive forces to free up the sodium and chloride ions. So this process, the chemical process that is involved is usually called an endothermic process. So this endothermic process just means that energy is put into the system to break the attractive forces. Similarly, our water molecules must also break the attractive forces within them such that they can create space. This attractive force is called hydrogen bonding. So the hydrogen bonds must be broken. And energy also must be put in to break these hydrogen bonds. So this process also is an endothermic process. So endothermic again means energy must be put in. Okay. Now step three usually involves 
attraction between our solute and solvent. So basically, for our solute to dissolve in our solvent, they must like each other and they must form stronger attractive forces. So if our solute and solvent, if sodium chloride and water form strong attractions, then enough energy is released to drive step one and step two. So step three is critical in solution making. So if enough energy is released in step three, then that means that enough energy will be available to drive step one and step two. And so we make a solution. If enough energy is not released in step three, then there wouldn't be enough energy to drive step one and step two. Okay. And our sol solute will not dissolve in our solvent. So step three usually release energy because these attractive forces must develop. So it's, it is an isothermic process. So this is isothermic process. So step three is an exothermic process, meaning energy is released. Okay, energy is released. Now we can summarize these interactions into a statement we usually hear often, which is like dissolves like. So let's look at the principles behind the statement like dissolves like. So what does it mean when you say like dissolves like? So let's look at statement one. So it said my mom says that solutes and solvent with similar intermolecular forces would dissolve into each other. What does this mean? This means that if you have a polar solute, then it's likely to dissolve in a polar solvent. So because water is polar and sodium chloride is polar, then they are likely to form a solution. Okay, so that's what it means. Now, statement two says that solutes and solvent with dissimilar intermolecular forces will not dissolve into each other. So what this means is if we have a polar solute, it's likely not to dissolve in a nonpolar solvent. A nonpolar solvent is one that you don't have positive and negative ends in it. Okay. And statement three says stronger solute solvent attractions favor dissolving. So this means that if you have stronger attractions develop in step three, then you are likely to form a solution because enough energy will be produced to drive step one and step two. So step three is critical to solution making. Okay, and that reflects in statement three. Now four says stronger solute, solute or solvent solvent attractions reduce dissolvent. This is true because if the attractive forces between your ions, so let's say our sodium chloride, is so strong, such that we don't have enough energy to break them, then of course it's likely we'll make a solution. Similarly, if the attractive forces in our solvent molecules, of course, is so strong that we don't have enough energy to break them from step three, then we are likely not to make a solution. Okay, so you see it. So what we discuss in the model is summarized in these statements and then simplified further to the statement like dissolves like. Okay. Now let's look at the chemical processes involved in solution making. One is classified as an exothermic solution making process. So this exothermic means that when you calculate the net energy of the solution making process, it is always negative. Okay. So let's look at this energy profile diagram. So the y axis is our energy axis. Okay. So what I want you to pay attention to is the energy level of our solute and solvent, which is here. The energy level of our solute and solvent, which is here, and the energy level of our solution. So as you can see, the energy level of our solute and solvent is higher than the energy level of our solution. So this tells us something. So this say, tells us that energy is released in the isothermic solution making process. Why is that? Now, we still have the same steps that we discussed. So step one requires energy to break the attractive force in our solute. Step two requires energy to break the attractive forces in our solvent. And once stronger solute solvent attraction is developed, the energy is released in step three. So if enough energy is released in step three, then there's sufficient energy to drive step one and step two. So we can calculate the total energy change for 
this dissolution process. So we'll say the total energy change is delta E theta. Remember, delta means change in energy. Change, delta means change, and E means energy, and T means total. So total energy change is equal to delta E1, which is the energy change for step one, plus delta E2, which is the energy change for step two, plus delta E3, which is the energy change for step three. Now we can relate these energy changes to what we call entropy of solution. So the entropy of solution for an exothermic solution making process is always negative in the sense that the first step, delta H, which is an entropy change for step one, is always greater than zero because it is an endothermic process. And therefore, step two, the entropy change is always greater than zero. And therefore, step three, the entropy change for step three is always less than one, zero because it's an exothermic process. So step one, endothermic, step two, endothermic, and step three, exothermic. So step three releases energy to drive step one and step two. And this energy is large enough such that it favors solution making. So if you calculate, if you add delta H1, which is the entropy change for step one, plus delta H2, the entropy change for step two, plus delta H3, the entropy change for step three, your entropy of solution is going to be negative because delta H3 is so large and negative. So as a result, your entropy of solution is going to be negative, which means that enough energy is released to drive step one and step two, and it favors solution making. Now let's look at endothermic solution making process. So this energy profile represents an endothermic solution making process. So again, what I want you to pay attention to is the energy level of our solid solvent and our solution. So clearly the energy level of our solid solvent is lower than the energy level of our solution. So this tells us something. So this says that not enough energy is released in step three to drive step one and step two. So because not enough energy is released in step three, that means that energy must be absorbed from the surroundings to help in the solution making process. Okay, so again, step one is enthalpy, changing enthalpy is greater than zero. Step two is changing enthalpy is greater than zero. And step three is changing enthalpy is less than zero. Okay, but not enough energy is released. So as a result, when you calculate enthalpy of solution, is going to be a positive value. So meaning energy must be absorbed from the surroundings into um, the system. So when not enough energy is released to drive step one and step two, then it means that entropy doesn't favor solution making in an endothermic process. So a second factor usually helps and this factor is referred as entropy. So what is entropy? Entropy is a measure of how energy spreads in the system. So if you think about the dissolution process, the sodium and the chlorine ions, as they dissolve in water, they spread, they move around in your water. So as they move, they spread the energy also that they have. So as a result, the entropy of the solution increases. And this increase in entropy, of course, helps in the solution forming. So, in a case whereby not enough energy is released in step three, entropy comes in to help. Yeah. So again, we can summarize entropy change for the entropy of solution for an endothermic process as delta H of solution equals to delta H step one plus delta H step two plus delta H step three. And again, delta H in the endothermic solution making process is always a positive value. Okay, because not enough energy is released in step three. Now let's look at how the ions appear when they dissolve in water. So here our blue circle represents our sodium ion. So blue circle with plus in the middle represents our sodium ion. And the green circle with minus in the middle represent our chloride ion. So I want you to pay attention to the orientation of water molecules around each ion. So see that the positive ion is surrounded by water molecules, but it's the oxygen that is attracted to the positive ion. This is because the oxygen is negatively charged. So 
negative charge will attract the positive charge. So they form what we call an ion dipole. So that is an ion dipole. So the attraction between the plus and the negative ion. So they form an ion dipole. And this attractive force is referred to as the ion dipole force. Okay. So yeah, so water molecule surrounds each ion, and this surrounding is referred as hydration. Okay. So if we look at the chloride ion also, you see that it's surrounded by water molecules. But look at the orientation of the water molecules. The hydrogen are the ones attracted to the chloride ion because they are oppositely charged. Chloride is negatively charged and hydrogen positively charged. So they are attracted to the negative ion, forming an ion dipole. Okay. Yeah, so that is how the ions appear in solution. Now, when we are writing ion equations, sometimes we write sodium chloride as sodium chloride AQ. What does that mean? The AQ means that dissolve in water. It's dissolving water. Now, the fact is we can't include the surrounding of water molecules for each ion in our equation. So we just use a shorthand where AQ means dissolving water. But you should know it means that each of these ions, of course, each one is surrounded by water molecules. So thanks for watching.